In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, I am going to share my Big Board 1.0. I know it's August. We have quite a time before the 2024 NBA Draft. But I'm going to share with you my top 30 prospects. There's a few guys who are on other draft boards that did not make my top 30. But that's because I have a few surprise prospects that I believe, when it's all said and done, are going to be first round picks in June. So stay tuned to find out who my sleeper prospects are for the 2024 NBA Draft. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And like I mentioned in the opening, this is my Big Board 1.0, my top 30 picks. There's a few surprises, but let's get started. All right. The first player coming in at number 30. Or I shouldn't say the first player, but coming in at number 30 on my big board 1.0 and his ranking is definitely not a reflection of his talent. I talked about him in the last episode, but it is Alexander Saar, who's from France, who played the last two years in the overtime elite league and is playing this season in the NBL in their next stars program. And I'll be honest, the next stars program, I thought the program was dead a couple years ago. I thought after NIL and the G league, I thought there's no way you're going to be able to get top, players especially american players to travel to australia to play for the season i was wrong totally wrong the next stars program has quite a few players that i think end up being first round picks one of them is alexander Saar. now Saar is extremely talented 7175 wingspan he's coordinated has good footwork soft touch around the rim has a nice turnaround jumper has all the skills that you want in a modern day five. Sounds like a guy that should be in contention for the number one pick. And I think the talent suggests that he should be in that discussion, but the production and the talent just not have, they just haven't matched up. They have not matched up at all. But again, he is extremely talented and I still got him at number 30, but I would like to see him higher on. Now, what I would like to see from him this season is in, I'm setting the bar high, but I would like to see him dominate, which I know is pretty, it's going to be very difficult because the NBL is the physical league. It's tough. He's playing against grown men and there is going to be a major adjustment period. But I think he has the skill set and the tools to dominate. I just don't think he's going to do it. However, the talent is there. Like I said, 7'1", 7'5", wingspan. He's coordinated. Shows flashes and upside of being able to shoot. He can handle. He's kind of like a wing. But I just want to see him put it all together. But that's why I have him at number 30. But again, if I was just going off just pure talent and, and high upside, he would be higher. All right, at number 29, I have another international player. But this player is playing stateside. It is a dim boner from UCLA. Now, I've been critical of Bona. I've been pretty critical of Bona. And the reason I've been critical of Bona is because when I first saw him play, it was in 2019. He was this young, energetic, raw athlete that was, I think he was like 16 years old, and he was playing on the under-18 Turkish national team. He shared a front court with this guy named Alperin Şengün, who is, I think, a phenomenal, phenomenal talent. And I unfairly compared the two. Even though Shingun is a little older and Bona is raw, at the time, again, this is 2019, I think if you would have polled every scout that was in the gym, they would have said, oh, I think Bona is the better long-term prospect just because he was extremely raw, athletic, had a great motor, which is still true to this day. Shingun has went from like this physical chubby bruiser to like this skilled this skilled low pay, low post score with nifty footwork soft touch a phenomenal passer and just the development of the two it, it's hard not to compare them because they were they were teammates bona has not in my opinion made many 
strides in developing the skill set. So that's one of the reasons why I've been pretty critical of him. But I've had to catch myself and understand that for the role that he plays and what he does well, appreciate what he does well and his strengths. And he's a defender. He is a vertical lob threat. He still plays with great energy. He rebounds. He blocks shots. And there is a role for him in the NBA as a, a defensive anchor. Now, this season is going to be interesting because I feel like he's missed a lot of developmental minutes because he's been out with a torn labrum. And unfortunately, he injured his shoulder, diving for a loose ball. I think it was in like the Pac-12 tournament. He was not able to go through the NBA pre-draft process. I met him in Chicago. And he is someone that I feel like really needs the developmental minutes, but he did not get them on the court this summer. I think he's probably not going to be cleared until October, but he's still raw offensively, but he can score off lobs and, and, and I don't want to say duck ins, but I mean like um, just hustle plays at the dunker spot. And he is, again, a great athlete, motor, defensive upside. If he can bring anything to the table on the offensive end, it's a bonus. What I would like to see from him this season, if possible, is just adding a little bit of offensive game, whether it's face-up game, whether it's soft-touch finishes around the rim, becoming a, a, a better shooter, at least being able to extend at least to the short corners and maybe to the elbows. But overall, I think just what he brings to the table from his defense, his ability to defend pick and rolls in space and protect the rim, I think that is worthy of a first round pick. So at number 29, I have a Dembona sophomore from UCLA. All right, coming in at number 28, this is a player that a lot of people aren't talking about. I think he's a first round talent coming from France, T. John Salon. He's 6'9, 205 pounds. I had a chance to watch him play at the Basketball Without Borders Camp All Star Weekend in Salt Lake City. Fairly new to basketball, fairly raw, but the physical tools, the athleticism, the, the toughness that he shows, and the promise as a shooter and shot maker are intriguing. He could be a riser also. I mean, we saw a fellow French prospect, Bilal Koulibaly, literally come out of nowhere and end up being a seventh pick in the draft. And Tijan has the tools that I think would be very enticing and intriguing to NBA scouts. He's young. He's only going to be 18 on draft night, but he is an excellent long-term prospect that has two-way potential. He is someone that can shoot the ball. He shot like 34% from three at the under-18s, and he is a just your athletic transition finisher. He can post up smaller guards. He can score around the rim. The question for him is the IQ. Again, still raw. Takes some difficult shots. Shot selection needs to be improved, but I think that is part of him being a little bit raw, but I think a little bit more experience can help him out. So I have Tijon at number 28, but he could easily, easily, easily climb into the lottery and maybe even into the top 10 if he has a strong season. He'll be playing professionally for a team called Cholet in France. So we'll see, but he is one of the younger players in this draft and his trajectory over the last two years I mean, NBA scouts have to be impressed and intrigued by, I mean, the growth that he's made over the last couple of years. All right, at number 27 is a guy that a lot of people are going to probably question why I have him so low, but it is Kalel Ware. Now, if you remember, Kalel Ware was highly, highly touted, especially around this time last year. A lot of people thought he was going to be a top 10 pick. Has excellent physical tools, 7 foot, 7'1", 220. Has a wingspan, a long wingspan, bouncy athlete. Best case scenario, he is your defensive anchor, your vertical lob threat, your shot blocker, a guy that can defend in space and, and, and guard pick and rolls and shoot the ball. He showed some promise as a shooter, but it all boils down to his motor. It all boils down to his motor. That is the biggest question mark about Khalil Ware. It's not the talent. It is the motor. And sometimes it just doesn't run. I know last year Dana Altman, his coach at Oregon, called him out a few times. And it got to the point where he wasn't even really playing much in the second half of the season. I think after December 1st, he may only have like four games in double figures the entire season. I don't know exactly what was going on going on in that entire situation, but it was honestly a disappointing season 
for Kalel Ware, which led for him to transfer to Indiana. Now, Indiana has a track record of, a recent track record of having a dominant big, which is Trace Jackson Davis. So maybe Ware can slide in, and if he's as productive as Trace Jackson Davis was last year, then he could be the number one pick. I don't know if that's possible. I don't think he has the offensive, complete offensive skill set as Jackson Davis, but he has better physical tools. But anyway, Khalil Ware, like I said, his size, length, mobility is always going to be intriguing. I just want to know if the motor is going to be consistent and if he can knock down open shots. He shot 30% from three this year. Not great numbers, but for a seven-footer that is young, it shows promise and upside on his touch. But Khalil Ware comes in at number 27 on my big board 1.0. All right, when we return, I want to talk to you about more prospects. At number 26, it is Omaha Blue. But before I share my thoughts on Blue, I want to talk to you about Ibotta. Why Ibotta? Well, because you're already spending money, so why not do it and get cash back? Whether it's you're picking up burgers or hot dogs for a summer barbecue, if you use Ibotta, you can get cash back. It is officially summer season. Well, summer is wrapping up but it's officially still summer, fall is coming up, and by fall coming up, you're gonna need new clothes. But your closet shouldn't be the only thing growing when you're making purchases. Now you can also watch your cash back grow with each purchase when you use Ibotta. So if you're looking to take a vacation in the fall and you're dreading buying all the necessities before you take off, it is time to stop spending your hard-earned money without getting anything in return because there is Ibotta. Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce to personal care to pantry goods. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you are purchasing. Either link your loyalty account or upload your receipt after you shop and you will get your cash back. It is that easy. The average Ibotta user earns $120 per year. Now that could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip or you can use your cash back to buy that flight that you've been eyeing, that game you're dying to see, or that fancy dinner that you've been craving. Now, I know there are other apps out there, but they give you points that don't amount to much at all. But with Ibotta, you can get real cash back that you can cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or your gift card. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 for trying Ibotta. But all you have to do is use the code LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D, when you register. Again, Ibotta. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app and use the code LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D. That is I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store and use the code LOCKED. You will get $5 just for trying it. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. This episode is part one of a three-part series where I'm doing my Big Board 1.0. All right, I want to talk about Omaha Blue. Great name. Great name. Named after my hometown, Omaha, Nebraska. Now, Blue is... I would say he's one of the biggest wild cards in the 2024 draft. I could see, best case scenario, he's a lottery pick, or I could see him being someone that may need to come back to school for a sophomore, maybe his junior year. And the reason I say that is because the talent is there, the tools are there, 6'8", 210, he's going to be a freshman at Iowa State. He's like this athletic combo forward that has a good motor, that impacts the game with his hustle plays, his energy, his rebounding, scoring in transition, offensive rebound putbacks. He's a good finisher around the rim. He shows flashes of a perimeter game. I would say probably a little bit more than just flashes because he has shown that he can put the ball on the floor and face up and score off the dribble. However, however, I feel like he was dominant on the high school level because of his physical tools. He was bigger, stronger, faster, and more athletic than most of his peers. While there are, like I said, signs and flashes of a perimeter skill set, I'm just curious to see how much he's developed over the season. Now, if he can show the perimeter skills, like I said, the ball handling, the attacking closeouts, and, the, and, and just being able to put the ball on the floor and finish, then I think he has the potential to be selected 
mid first round, maybe even higher. But if it's if he's totally just dependent on the physical tools and the motor and the perimeter skills are shaky of the jumper isn't falling, then I think it could be in his best interest to come back. But that's just my early thoughts. However, I like the talent. He's a classic tweener, even though tweener is not a word that is, it doesn't have the same negative connotation as it did years ago. Even though he is a classic tweener, I think that he is somewhat between an undersized power player and maybe not skilled enough right now to be a three. But if he can show a combination of both or show more perimeter skills, then the sky's the limit for Omaha Blue. All right, at number 25, I have a player that I talked about in the last episode that he is someone that I'm wondering, is the hype real? Is he all flash and no substance? And it is Baba Miller. Now, Baba Miller is extremely talented, 6'11", 205, sophomore from Florida State. He can handle the ball, shows flashes of being able to shoot. I'll get to that in a second. But he is someone that had a late growth spurt and he was able to retain a lot of the guard skills and fluidity and mobility. You basically just don't see guys six foot 11 that move like he does. He has the tools to be a switchy defender, defend all over the place. I've heard some people say that he has a little bit of Giannis in his game. Now, as far as the physical tools and how he moves and, and so on, not necessarily the same motor or not saying he's going to be like an MVP and, and, and NBA champion. But there are some people that believe that at the same stage in his development, he's a lot further along than Giannis was. But the question is, is he all hype? And this was a past episode. I don't repeat everything I said in the last episode. So if you missed it, check it out. I did an episode called Worth the Hype. And I asked questions about three guys that I've, I've talked about. Baba Miller, Khalil Ware, and Alexander Saar. Now with Baba Miller, he only averaged four points per game last year. Four points, three rebounds, 25% from three, 30% from the foul line. Now he shot 47% from the floor, which is fine, but the majority of his points came on post-ups, or as far as his efficient baskets. And I don't think that is his greatest strength. So with Baba Miller, you're basically just buying into the upside and the long-term potential not necessarily what you saw on the floor last year at Florida State. Now, I will say that he did miss the first 16 games of the season because of just an absolutely hideous suspension by the NCAA. I mean, it's crazy. We got NIL. We got guys making like a million dollars playing college basketball, and they suspend him for 16 games over $3,000. But when he came back, he was not the player that I thought he would be. I had him as a first-round pick pretty much the entire season, especially when he hadn't played. I was giving him the benefit of the doubt from what I saw from Real Madrid and with the Spanish national team. And then he just only averaged four points a game. Did not look confident. I know there was an injury, but I felt like even with the injury that he had last off season, he had a long time to rehab and prepare. So anyway, Bob Miller could be someone that is in the lottery range with the good season. But the four points per game, there were times last year where he just looked like it was all flash and no substance. But I'm buying into the talent and the upside. I think it's still worth the risk as a first round pick as of today. But he's gotta fix the shooting. Very low release point on his shot and he was a poor free throw shooter. 30%, like I said, as a freshman at Florida State. Only 57% from the foul line at the U19s and he only shot 26% on jumpers. So if he can improve his shooting and become more efficient, but I think his shooting issues are directly related to his low release point. I mean, he has a very low release point. I know Kevin Durant also has a low release point, but Kevin Durant is a lights out shooter and he has the creativity and the handle and the, and the wiggle to get to his spots to create space. But Baba Miller has such a low release on his shot that I wonder, because the release is so low, and if a point guard or whoever drives and kicks and they pass it out to him, does the low release point turn an open shot into a contested shot? And I think that has a lot to do with the low percentages. All right, at number 24, 
I have Trayvon Brazil. Brazil was someone that I had as a first round pick early last year until he went down and it was unfortunate. He was playing tremendous basketball, goes down with a torn ACL after just nine games. Now, when you look at his numbers, not including the ninth game where he got hurt, because I think he only played like seven or nine minutes or something like that. But he was averaging 13 points, six and a half rebounds, 1.1 assists, 1.1 steals, and 1.1 blocks per game. And he was also shooting 38% from three on 29 attempts. And we're talking about on a 6'10", 210-pound frame, 220 pounds. Now, I saw some of his potential as a freshman at Missouri. He transfers to Arkansas last year and... I would say that he was at least, it was early in the season, it was very early, but the way he was playing, I thought it was enough to be considered for a first round pick. I love the trajectory, I love the upside, and the fact that he's 6'11", I mean, he is a crazy athlete. He had the dunk of the year, in my opinion. Go back, I forgot which game it was, but he had the dunk of the year in only nine games. He only played nine games, he had the dunk of the year. He has the athletic tools, he's a shot blocker, he is someone that gets steals. He was averaging, like I said, Basically, you add it up over two stocks per game and shooting 38% from three. The talent is there. He could also be someone that could skyrocket up draft boards. He won't have the same talent around him at Arkansas that he had last year. I mean, from Ricky Council to Anthony Black. I would say Nick Smith, but <laughs> they I think they missed each other. I don't even know if they even played. I doubt if they even played a single game together. Maybe if it was early. But before his injury, Brazil was just showing like a mix of explosive plays above the rim, the shot blocking, the defensive versatility, and the floor spacing potential that was enticing and intriguing to NBA scouts. So what I would like to see from him this year is, one, I want to see if he's healthy. And fortunately for him, and I guess there's never a time to be injured, but he was injured early enough last season to where he's had... A long rehab, I mean, I would say it's probably going to be close to nine or ten months between the injury and his first game. So he should be healthy. Just want to know if he comes back healthy as far as like the mental part of it. Because, I mean, I've never been injured before. But I imagine that's probably one of the hardest parts to overcome is trusting your knee and trusting whatever after you've had a surgery. But if he can show the flashes of shot blocking, floor spacing, and defensive versatility on top of retaining the same athleticism... He could be someone that is a lot higher than where I have him at number 24. All right, when we return, I'll talk about prospects 23, 22, and 21 on my mock, that's not my mock draft, on my big board 1.0. Stay tuned. All right, last segment coming in at number 23. Again, this is an episode that I'm gonna break up into three parts. This is part one, prospects 30 through 21. All right, at number 23, I have Bobby Clinton. 6'10", 225 pound Swedish prospect. He will also be playing in the NBL this year. Played last year at Wake Forest. Again, another player that showed flashes of his upside and potential, not necessarily was the most productive on paper as far as accounting stats, but Clement is 6'10", 225, and he has all the tools that you would like in a modern day four, or maybe combo forward. Like I said, 6'10", 225. On paper, he averaged just 5.3 points per game, 4.5 rebounds, but he revealed promise as a two-way player that can defend, knock down open shots, create scoring opportunities for teammates. He is a good passer, and he shot like 37% from three. Now, why he didn't play a lot of Wake Forest, I have no idea. But I understand. For him, all right, he's in his weird predicament. I mean, a lot of people thought that he had a promise and that he was going to be a first-round pick and maybe early second round. But he's in his weird predicament to where... I imagine he didn't feel like he had the role that he wanted at Wake Forest. And instead of going to the draft where there were no guarantees, he decides to go to the NBL in Australia. He's going to get a chance to play professionally and make a little bit of money, even though, you know, he's probably making money in, in college. But play professionally in a physical league and, and really show NBA scouts that the flashes and glimpses of 
I don't even know if that's the word. The flashes of potential that he showed at Wake Forest are legit. And again, he is talented. He can defend. He can knock down open shots. He's a good rebounder. Played, I want to say, like 20 minutes per game. Now he's like four and a half rebounds. And so if he can put it all together, he is someone that could be, end up being selected a lot higher than where I have him at number 23. But what I would like to see out of him this year is becoming a better finisher. Despite the fact that he's a good athlete, nice frame, broad shoulders, he only shot 44% on layups last season. 44% on layups despite the fact that he has those physical tools. So I would like to see him improve, but the Australian NBL is physical. So if he has trouble finishing at the rim in college basketball, I wonder how he'll finish in Australia where the guys are bigger, they're older, they're stronger, but puts on a little bit of weight, gets a little stronger, he could fix that issue because again, the tools are there. But at number 23, I have Bobby Clintman, who will be playing for, I think the name of the team is called Carnes. I can't, I don't know, Carnes in Australia. All right, at number 22, it is a player that I'm really high on and I think is being undervalued on a lot of big boards. It is also Igodaro from Marquette. Igodaro is 6'9", 225, good athlete, average 11 points, six rebounds, three assists, 1.6 blocks per game, while shooting 65% from the floor last year. Athletic finisher, was one of the top pick and roll finishers in all of college basketball last year. He's a good defender, but it is his passing that I believe is his greatest strength. He is a phenomenal passer, finds cutters. I mean, he whips behind the back passes from the mid post. He is an excellent passer. I think there's a role for him as a glue guy in the NBA. His 3.3 assists and only 1.6 turnovers basically just exemplify his excellent basketball IQ and his decision making. And according to my guy from No Ceilings, Maxwell Bamba, he mentioned that Iguodaro was the only high major player in the last decade, 6'9 or above, that had an assist percentage over 18% and a 2 to 1 assist to turnover ratio. But the concern is he does not space the floor. He only took three shots outside the paint last year. Three shots. And is a poor foul shooter. Which is crazy because he has excellent touch around the rim. Like when you watch his film, he has hooks and floaters. I mean, he's just an excellent finisher around the basket. And it's not just all dunks. Soft touch, like I said. But for some reason, once he gets outside of maybe five to seven feet, the touch just disappears. Only 54% at the foul line. The limited range is very puzzling, but if he can show improved range, maybe some short corner jumpers, then I think he could solidify himself as a first round pick. What's tricky is he's six, nine, and right now he plays more like a five. If he's not going to space the floor, which I think he has a ways to go, then he ends up having to be a five. And so I think that he's a little bit undersized for the five, so that could be a little tricky, but I do think that he is someone that can have a long NBA career just because he is an excellent finisher. He can be your lob threat, and he's such a great ball mover. All right, last for today's episode at number 21, it is Kyle Filipowski from Duke. Filipowski, seven foot, 220 pounds, who is surprisingly returning for his sophomore year. Seven foot, 225 pound center. I definitely think that he is in for a huge sophomore year. I mean, he had a great freshman year. I mean, as a freshman, he averaged 15 points, 8.9 rebounds, 1.3 steals. He won ACC Rookie of the Year, ACC Tournament MVP, was honorable mention All-America, was the Kyle Macy National Freshman of the Year, and he led all freshmen in college basketball, at least Division I freshmen, in double-doubles. But he comes back to Duke, which is returning four starters. Like, how often does Duke return four starters? They're returning four starters but lost two players to the first round of the NBA draft. That is, like, probably one of the weirdest combinations I've ever heard. Now, Filipowski is one of the most versatile and talented offensive players in this draft class. Again, he's a seven-footer. He can handle the ball. In theory, 
you would like to see him shoot the ball better. Only shot 28% from three. That was considered one of his strengths coming into the season. But in theory, he can space the floor. He can make plays for others. He can make plays out of actions, whether it's dribble handoffs. He is a good passer, has a good feel for the game, is an excellent rebounder. Like I said, 8.9 rebounds per game, can get a rebound, push the floor, is extremely, extremely skilled and should be in a better position this year because he won't have to share the floor with Derek Lively. Now, I imagine when Duke put their team together, they probably thought Lively would man the middle, be the vertical lob threat, and Filipowski would be the floor spacer, but unfortunately, he just was not making threes at an efficient rate, but I expect that number to go up. The one thing that I'm going to be really paying attention to this season with Filipowski is how well he moves. Now, last year, again, I named all the accolades. He did all that with some bad hips. He had arthroscopic surgery on each of his hips. So you make, it makes me think, like, if he was that productive with two bad hips, and I, I believe it was like some structural issues, then how much was his mobility limited last year due to his hips? Now, if he was limited last year and he comes back this year and he's healthy and he's more mobile and fluid, then we could be in for a big, big year from Kyle Filipowski. But what I would like to see from him is just more consistency as far as shooting the three. I think he's a much better shooter than the numbers indicated. But if he can shoot better from three, better than 28%, if he can just get to like 33, 34, I think that would be tremendous. But another area that I want to pay attention to is how well he finishes around the rim. He just shot 51.7% on layups as a freshman last season. So I'd like to see that number go up. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. This is part one of a three-part series where I give my big board 1.0. I cover picks or prospects. I'm so used to saying picks like it's a mock drive. I cover prospects 30 through 21. Stay tuned in the next episode. Where I talk about the next range of players. And my big board, once again, is Raphael Barlow, and I am out.